Okay, all right, I'm gonna hit okay. So uh, I'm gonna set a timer for 50 minutes so I don't talk about myself for longer than I need to. Um, so I, um, hi, my name's Katie and I am a grateful uh, recovering alcoholic. Um, I'm, I, my sobriety date is November the 22nd, 2019. And uh, I've been getting Steven's emails for years. So uh, when he said he needed speakers, I thought, you know what, let me volunteer. Um, so I just celebrated uh, four years and some change uh, this past November, and I'll be working, I'm working on year five, one day at a time. I uh, just can't believe more. It already will be half a decade that has flown by. So um, I don't know really where I want to begin, um, but I'll just, you know, tell you a bit, a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, 38 years old. I am married uh, to a wonderful man I met through uh, the program. Uh, I am a we are I am a beagle enthusiast. I have uh, three beagles named Lucy, Blackjack, and uh, Daisy. They're the apple of my eye. Um, I am a psychiatric social worker, and I run my own business um, here in Pennsylvania. And I originally hail from the New York City area. So where does it begin? How did I end up here? So prior to uh, entering the rooms, um, prior to 2014, I had what you would call a healthy relationship with alcohol. I was a truly social drinker. I would drink when I turned 21. Yeah, I went out and had fun with my friends, but never really... Never really went to anything to excess, you know, maybe in college I'd have a few beers, you know, when we went out and then I was one of those people, take it or leave it, have a glass of wine. I was the type of person that if we go out with the family and I ordered a glass of wine, people would be like, oh, Katie's having something to drink. Well, in 2014, I made the decision to have bariatric surgery. Um, I've lost a total of over 200 pounds. I've kept most of it off, but uh, as you all know, know, alcohol has carbs. Um, so I had that surgery in 2014, and I am grateful I did. It was a wonderful thing I did. But what they don't tell you is 40% of people develop, become alcoholics after the surgery. So I didn't know that. And I, did, I knew that. I, I read it. And, you know, I have a master's in public health, so I was like, I knew it was a risk, but I wasn't really concerned about it because I don't, I didn't really have um, an issue with alcohol. But prior to my surgery, you know, when I had the surgery, I didn't know I had the other risk factors too. Generalized anxiety disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I had been diagnosed with those for many, many years. And um, I was doing fine, but I didn't know that this would create the perfect storm. So 2015 comes, I am in social work school, uh, my first semester, and you know, I'm losing weight, things are great. And I didn't really consider alcohol. Um, it didn't really, it wasn't part of my life, you know? It, it was like a take it or leave it kind of approach, but I noticed when I would would drink that it, I would always want more. And I thought it was manageable. But now looking back, it was the beginnings of my alcoholism. It was the beginnings of my alcoholism. And I truly believe that I was born with the alcoholic switch. And that's when it decided to turn on. Um, but at the time, I was, um, you know, working full time. I was in school full-time and I was living between two households. I was living with my then boyfriend who shall remain nameless and my parents and I was balancing a lot but I was okay. Well I didn't realize it but I kept buying bottles of wine. Kept buying them and it, it was to the point where it was like three or four a week in the garbage and I just thought it was normal, you know, wine culture, women in wine. I just thought it was normal. And I realized that I couldn't go a day without it. So, you know, just, just time went on and I broke up with this said partner and um, 
at 30, how old was I? 30, 31. At 32 years old, I had to move back in with my parents. Which really was, as much as I love them, they were on this meeting, but um, really wasn't what my plan was. Um, and I was, mental health is a big part of my story. So um, I will be discussing that. Um, and I was between psychiatrists at the time. Um, my old one had retired. So I was seeing somebody in the interim and my medications were out of whack and they were out of control. My anxiety was upset. I was just a mess. So I turned to booze. And I continued to drink to the point of where I knew it was a problem. I knew I had a problem for years. And I just didn't say anything. You know, it was kind of one of those things everyone thought, oh, Katie, I just thought I'd regulate myself. It was just a phase. Well, I realized it wasn't. Um, I can honestly say 2017 and 2018 are blurs to me. Um, I have some recollections of that time, but not a lot. You know, um, I remember things, but my memory is pretty, is pretty well known in my family. But that was at the height of it. And in 2018, October 7th to be exact, um, I went to my first meeting. And that is in my home group in New York, uh, Somer Serendipity. And that was in my original sobriety date. But that was the first day I said, hi, I'm Katie, I'm an alcoholic. And that, to me, was the biggest relief um, I ever felt. Because I finally admitted it to myself. I said it out loud. I said it in public. And I knew I was at the place that I needed that would give me the help that I needed. So um, I remember walking to that first meeting um, in the church basement. Uh, I wasn't nervous. I was okay. I was excited, actually. But I remember walking in and just being over. Um, you know you I think we all have experienced that in our first in our first meeting I just remember coming in and being just overwhelmed and you know kind of confused about the lingo confused about what to do I was overwhelmed by people giving me their phone numbers I was in active withdrawal that really wasn't I wasn't feeling good um but I have to say I was in and out in 2018, I won't lie. Um, but I had a, I had about, I kind of muddled together about eight or nine months. And then I decided I had almost a year mark, you know what? I think I can drink. You know, maybe this was just a phase, like everyone said, and every one of those meetings was wrong. Well, now I relapsed in November of 2019 and I relapsed bad. It was like my magnum opus, my final send off to my technical best friend. And on, on November 22nd, 2019, I had my last drink. Now, what happened next was pretty embarrassing. Um, my parents took me to detox just to, because they wouldn't let me sleep in the house that night. They're like, I don't care where you go, but you're not staying in the house this night. And it was the first time I realized wow, I really screwed this one up. And um, I went to detox. Thank God I did actually for like that day and a half because I didn't realize how dangerous it could have been. So I was glad I was getting the medical monitoring, but I didn't like it. I was the only alcoholic in a ward full of people coming off of hard drugs. And I understand, you know, it's the same disease, it's different things. But I had different needs. I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to do things. I wanted to, I was like, is there an AA meeting here? And I felt claustrophobic. I felt my anxiety was off the roof. Like I, I felt like, like I knew I had to be there. But I actually, on the 20th, I signed myself out. And my rationale was, is I've done this before. I could do this again. Um, I'm very lucky I am privileged I have access I had access to some of the be best mental health care that uh insurance would cover so I um 
you know, came back home, went right back to my home group meeting that night. And I've not had a drink ever since, but I did enroll myself um, in intensive outpatient, which was in December of 2019. Can everyone remember a time in December of 2019? Let's remember that world, <laughs> right? Pre-COVID, COVID was just the thing in China. So I enrolled myself in IOP, and at this time, um, a family member of mine got really sick, and it was at the hospital that was attached to the IOP. So I was spending more time with my family than I was in the IOP program, um, because I was like, you know what, I got to focus on my family. You know, IOP really, it wasn't helping. Um, the only good thing I did get out of that was I did get my psychiatric medications looked at and the combination of meds they had me on there, I am still on today. And that was really the turning point. Um, but I didn't need to sit in a room of people who were mandated from the court when I wanted to be there. Um, you know, it was just, I know a lot of people have wonderful experiences. I did not. Um, and I kept telling them, I'm like, why is this program not 12 step based? Like where are the AA meetings? Where's this? Where's that? Oh yeah, no, we're going to have group. I go, how is playing with a volleyball or some stupid game? But how's this going to help me? I go, this place is making me sicker. So I left. Um, and I kind of came to my own conclusion that AA is what works for me, you know, in conjunction with, um, medically assisted treatment. And therapy, that's what really worked for me. So let's go to January of 2020. Remember everyone, happy new year, 2020. Oh, it's gonna be a great year, a new decade. Well, we all know what happened. So it's 2020. I am working in this oh, hard, hard job, but I needed to work. And March of 2020 comes. We all know what happened. So I knew it was bad when I was looking at my phone at work. And I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, whatever. And I go, oh, hey, hey, closed. Who remembers the day GSO sent out the big email, the announcement that AA had to move online? So this is kind of really where, uh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. This is kind of really when what it's like now started. So I left my job because I have a family member um, in my home who is was is immunocompromised at the time. And I knew the place I was working at wasn't taking COVID seriously. And plus, you were able to get that sweet unemployment. So I was like, you know what? I'm still working on my recovery. I'm going to take this as a time to kind of relax, reinvent myself, rejuvenate. You know, it was kind of like my own self-imposed spa. So... Come January 2020, um, AA was moving online, and uh, I was excited about it because I'm like, this is like the new frontier. I said, this is great. You know, prior there had been meetings online um, with, I don't know if a lot of you know, in the rooms.com wasn't really a fan of it, um, just clunky. It, you know, you, you'd click on a meeting, it'd be like a sex addicts meeting. And then it was just, cl it was clunky. So I um, was the GSO rep for my group. And I also happened to be pretty tech savvy. So um, I ended up getting trained in setting up Zoom and setting up Zoom groups. And I began to set up AA Zooms uh, for groups all over the country. And um, it was a really exciting time, actually, that whole transition from um, on, from you know in person to online. You know, I think as a whole, us airs. I think we actually there was an article in the uh, New York Times that stated that online recovery meetings kept Zoom in business and helped it become a multi billion dollar company. So kudos to us. But it was exciting. Um, you know, I was focusing on my recovery. It was keeping me busy um, and I was able to maintain my sobriety. And um, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, 
Um, I am one of the founding members of a 24-7 uh, online meeting called aahomegroup.org. Um, we are there 365 days a year, and um, it was just something I really, I got involved in. So me being me, you know, I'm a 30-something-year-old woman on Facebook, and uh, the region in New York, um, trust me, I'm, get, I'm getting somewhere here. Uh, the region of New York that I was from had this regional AANA Facebook group. So it had constant, constant updates. So I was chairing a three speaker meeting on Sunday evenings for my home group. And it's some Sunday in June, and I am desperate for a speaker. I, I filled the first spot, filled the second, couldn't find a third. So I put out this SOS and the sky answers and says hey i need a meeting you know i've been i've been back and forth between new york and pa and i you know i have time to share my story so i said okay so i gave him the link gave him my number and yeah little did i know my higher power had an alternate plan he was gonna tell me in a few months like this is the person you're supposed to marry <laughs> so um so basically my husband's name is kevin he's got uh eight years in the room and my father-in-law is like 13 so we're trying to keep it in the family so anyway he volunteers and he shares the meeting and i'm single at this point and i was okay with it kind of look at the screen i'm like this bad looking this cute so we ended up just staying in touch and we hit it off and you know and it was it was just we stayed, it was literally the most innocent thing. We stayed in touch about updates to meetings, like what groups were meeting in parks, what groups were trying to start up again in places, where do you want to wear a mask, you know, all that stuff that was in COVID that summer when things were kind of opening up prior to the miraculous vaccine. So he didn't 13 step me. He did, I, I, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, he 13 step him. Like, no, he was a gentleman. He texted me, can I use your phone number for non AA purposes? And I said, all right. So we met for coffee. We had a plan it three weeks in advance. We had a quarantine two weeks before we even met. And uh, that's how I met my husband, Kevin. <laughs> um, you know, and I uh, met him during the pandemic. And um, it went so well that two and a half months into uh, that early, late summer, early fall, I moved to Pennsylvania to be with him. I just said, if the time is right, why not, you know? And uh, it was kind of just one of those things, uh, you know, life on life terms. And I have to say it was the best decision I ever made. So it's kind of bit my story. I don't want to kind of give you guys a drunk log, but um, you know, what is my life like now? I really want to focus on that. So I wake up every day and the one thing I do perfectly is step one every day. I admit that I'm a powerless over alcohol and I don't drink no matter what. Um, you know, alcohol these days, it doesn't, it doesn't live rent free in my head anymore because of the program, because of the steps. Um, you know, it is something that I, I'm neutral to it now as our big book tells us. Um, it's taken me a long time to get here. Um, you know, four and a half, five years ago, I was broke, miserable, anxious, probably even a little depressed, you know, under medicated at a dead end job, um, you know, social work, you have a lot of really not good places. We all end up in them. And, you know, I just kind of, I was waiting for my life to start, you know, I was 30 something years, 30 34, five, 34, going on 35. And I was, you know, just waiting for my life to start, you know, waiting for my plane to take off. You know, all my friends around me had been married, some were on second marriages, uh, having kids. And I was just living with my mom and dad, plugging along, doing this thing called life. And, you know, come COVID, a lot of things, it was a good thing for me, pandemic. Um, taught me to give up control. 
I was a very, very like things had to be bup, 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 very regimented. And the pandemic really taught me how to give up control. I, I couldn't control what was going on in the world. And I couldn't control, I couldn't control things, you know, and I delved into my recovery. I was on meetings from probably the five in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. I traveled all over the world from my iPad. And I think a lot of us can say that that was the incredible thing about the pandemic. You know, we got to meet AAs from I met people from as far as South Africa. Um, I used to attend this little women's meeting out of Bermuda, um, you know, and it was just nice in those early stages of my sobriety uh, after my relapse to learn from other people. And I got to see how AA was done in different countries. And it, it was the same program, but, you know, each with a different flair. And, um, you know, my family often will laugh and say, Katie, we remember during the pandemic, we would hear you in your bedroom. Hi, Sally. Hi, Sam. Oh, good to see you. Happy anniversary, you know, and these are my friends. I would be on the computer for hours a day. And I honestly have to say, if it was not for Zoom, um, maintaining sobriety probably would have been hard because I really counted on my daily meeting, um, my daily dose of AA. I really count on it. I still do to this day. Um, but, you know, what does my life look like now? Well, I get up every morning. I First thing I do is grab a cup of water and then I get my coffee. I mean, we all know it. We're all on AA, so we all know how important coffee is. And I let my three beagles out into the yard of the house that I rent. I let them play. And then I sit down and my morning is my me time. It's my sober time. I, if I don't get on a meeting in the morning, um, I at least try to do something such as maybe watch intervention on like Facebook or, you know, Netflix or something. And I talk to other alcoholics in the morning. Um, I have a few friends that I message with every day who are all female alcoholics. And we're all kind of like each other's accountability um, buddies. But, you know, that's what I do in the morning. And then I get ready and I go to work. And if it was not for this program, I would not be where I am. Um, I have the opportunity to, I was given, um, I was part of a small practice. It was just me and another person. And we, she ended up, we wanted to expand the practice and a few prescribers too much money. So I had the opportunity two and a half years ago, I was given my half of the business for free. And it was one of those opportunities that I knew in the long run would pay off. Um, you know, my ultimate goal uh, when I got my social work degree was to go into private practice. Um, I didn't think it would happen this soon, seven years after graduation. But, um, you know, I wake up every day go to my job, I work for myself. And if it was not for the program and the principles and the hard work that I have put in, I wouldn't be here. If I was still drinking, I would still be working at some nursing home, making $40,000 a year, miserable. But here I am now, make, here I am now living a life beyond my wildest dreams. Um, you know, the promises have started to come true for me. Pages 83 to 84 in the big book or something that, I really try to, um, I read them daily. I love them so much. I have them printed out and stapled um, at the right of my desk on what I call my AA wall. Um, I have them. I have this like one day at a time poster. I have page 417. I have the steps. I And I look at that every day while I'm at work. You know, it's, it's for me. It's not for anyone else. It's for me. But um, in my work, I come a lot of I come across a lot of people who are struggling, and um, you know I, I when they come to me I say nothing. I don't tell them that I'm in recovery. I do not tell them that I'm an alcoholic in recovery. Um, but usually when people start to talk and share, they'll be like, "Oh, you get this," and I then I will you know share. You know, there's a lot to be said about this program. You know, um, this program works. 
AA works. The 12 steps works. Meetings work. Why? Because it's simple. Keep it simple, stupid. If I can do anything in uh, 24 hours, I can do it again. And that's how I live my life. You know, I have an app on my phone. I'm, I'm very technologically inclined. An app on my phone. I am sober. And I remember when this said one day. Now I'm at 1,516 days. Which equals to four years, one month, and 25 days. And, you know... It's, it's funny because I do try to help a lot of newcomers, um, you know, a lot of women coming into the rooms and even, you know, young people in general, you know, young people tend to reach out to each other. I'm 38, so I may look like I'm 20, but I'm really almost 40. Uh, but, you know, newcomers coming into the room, I hope there are some of you on here tonight. Um, we all been there. You know, we all had our day ones. We all had the hard times we all have those times when we wanted to give up but it keeps it fresh for me because whenever I either hear in a meeting somebody relapsed or whenever I see on like a Facebook group I'm part of for women in sobriety and you can hear the pain you can feel it I always comment keep on keep on trucking there is a solution and you know there is a solution and this is it Sharing our experience, strength, and hope with each other. Living one day at a time. You know, I threw my, you know, when I fully surrendered in step one, I just said, you know what, God? Take my alcoholism and this is your responsibility now. I cannot do this alone. You know, the most dangerous words an alcoholic can say to somebody is, I got this. I can do this. I got this. Well, you're setting yourself up for failure because if you had had it and it was just you, you probably wouldn't have probably wouldn't have kept on relapsing. It's a we program. It's a program of action. Um, you know, one of the most powerful things though is um, the relationships I've healed with people. You know, I've essentially kind of healed my entire relationship with my family. And, um, you know, they never left me, but I think the person that came up out of this on the other side is somebody who I was meant to be. I am grateful I'm an alcoholic. I am grateful to be an AA. I am not ashamed that I am a recovering alcoholic. I have met the community, the friendship, the family, um, you know, AA has given me my life. I It helped me take my life back. You know, it is just something that I know I have to do the rest of my life. Um, you know, it's something that is such a part of my life that I feel weird if I don't do it. It's such a part of my routine. It is just something that I do on a daily basis that... Um, you know, going to meetings, talking to others. I mean, for God's sakes, my entire life is a meeting. All it takes is two alcoholics and a big book. You know, my husband's one of us too. You know, but to see where I was, where I am now, it, it's a testament to this program. You know, and, uh, you know, I got about another 10, five, 10 minutes. So I don't want to talk all day because I can go on and on about myself. I find it hard to do that these days. But, um, you know, my favorite thing to do is step 12, carry the message. Um, you know, because I was always told when I first came in that I might be the only example of recovery that that person sees that or sees ever. And I try to carry that in everything that I do. Um, you know, I... Um, I have a couple of clients who are struggling with alcohol addiction and alcoholism. And, you know, I really focus the work on building a network, building a, I take the tools that I've learned in AA and I use them professionally. And I think also too, the AA program has helped me in many aspects of my life, especially even in my married life. Um, you know, my husband and I are 
we were meant for each other. It was just one of those things. It made sense. <laughs> you know how they tell you. I, I was like, oh, this just makes sense. But, you know, we have a really, we have a happy marriage, a healthy marriage, a sober marriage, because we have the 12 steps in our lives. You know, we don't go to bed angry. We apologize when we're wrong. We are honest with each other. You know, um, it's just one of those things, you know, the 12 steps are just who we are. Um, so I'm going to, what, I have about, I think, five more minutes. So I'm just going to set a five-minute timer because I don't want to overgo the hour. Um, so I really think that's obnoxious. Um, hold on here. It's going to set a timer for, like, six more minutes. So I know Todd told me between uh, 45 and 50. So we'll do 45. But, you know, my advice to anybody on this meeting who is struggling, thinking of picking up that next drink, is play the tape through. Play the video through. Play the TikTok through. Do you really want to wake up tomorrow morning and see a picture of you passed out with a bunch of beer cans on Facebook? I don't think anybody really wants that. You know, it's embarrassing. You know, but please think the tape think the drink through. Do you really need, is having that glass of wine or having that beer really going to make a difference? It's going to make the situation worse. You know, I think how many times would we say, oh, a drink's going to help the situation. And then before you know it, you're sitting in a cop car wondering how the hell did I get here? You know, uh, for us, it's to drink or to die. For me, I'd break out into the psych ward. You know, the big book tells us death jails are institutions. If I kept going the way I was going, it was institutions. And, um, you know, I'm just glad I stopped when I did. Because I have seen and I have read, you know, I've seen the effect of long-term alcoholism. It's not, a, I've seen it in my career. It's not a pretty way to go. You know, I want to die a sober 97-year-old, um, you know, hopefully I'm square dancing or something. But, you know, um, you know, this program has given me a life um, beyond my wildest dreams. My problems now are luxury problems. My problems now are, why are there three tractor trailers ahead of me and there's snow and they're flashing their lights and of course, their exit from 80 is closed. You know, my biggest problem is, is, oh, I gotta pay a bill. I don't like paying bills. I don't like paying taxes, but I'm grateful I can. You know, my problems these days are, oh, what design am I going to get on my nails in two weeks? You know, it, it's just amazing with what dropping the rock really did for me. Um, so I am going to end it at there, Todd. So um, I don't know if you guys want to do a question and answer or how do you do this?